Uh, our lesson today has to do with steadfast. Now, Rex wanted to preach this. I really didn't want to preach this one. I just want you to know. And you're going to be able to see that in the, how conglomerated or combotulated or disconjointed or whatever you want to say this lesson really is. It is a good lesson. And it is a lesson that every Christian needs. But it is a difficult lesson to she had perfect attendance that year from the beginning to the end. And when I say perfect attendance, I mean perfect attendance. Now, there are a lot of parents that come down to the school after school was out and say, my kid had perfect attendance. And I would look back and I'd say, no, they checked in late on such and such a date. Or you checked them out early on such and such a date. And that's not perfect. And they would say, but they were there every day. Well, Karen wasn't that way. From the beginning of kindergarten until the end of kindergarten, she was not late a single day. She did not check out early a single day, and she would, did not miss a single day. Not only that, but she graduated Henry County High School with perfect attendance also, not having missed a single day, not checking out early a single day, and not checking in late a single day. She had perfect attendance. And every year between K through 12, she did exactly the same thing. When she got through with the eighth grade at spring, well, I said, Karen, and as our little graduation exercises from the eighth grade, I said, Karen, if you can go through all four years of high school this way, I will buy you a steak supper. That's an interesting feat. And I promised her that steak supper, and she did it. And we went to Murray and had a steak at Ryan's Steakhouse. <laughs> she was steadfast. And I wish that I could say that in my spiritual living, I am as steadfast as she was. And when you look back on that, you say, well, that's equivalent to faithfulness. And I asked Rex, I said, what's the difference in being steadfast and faithful? He texted back to me and he said, probably nothing. But there is a difference in the way we're going to look at it today. It will wind up being exactly the same thing. But we're going to look at it slightly different today. Our text comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. And that's in what we call the, quote, resurrection chapter, because the resurrection is mentioned all through it. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, I have two words underlined there for you to put into your outlines this morning. The words are therefore and steadfast. And as you go through this lesson with me today, I have a feeling you're going to say, why didn't he name that therefore instead of steadfast? <laughs> well, there would be some ammunition that you could have to use against me to prove that that's exactly what the lesson title ought to be. But the title is called Steadfast. But you can't understand what Paul's talking about in the steadfastness there. I can give you a, a dictionary definition out of the Greek language. I took Strong's Concordance, uh, Scott, and I found all the places steadfast, steadfastly and steadfastness were given. And I looked all of those up in the Greek dictionary. And I could give you that that dictionary definition and close to the end I'm going to give you a definition but right now there's no need in it I want you to understand what Paul's talking about in this passage but in order to do that you got to understand the therefore if you miss the therefore you will miss what Paul is talking about with steadfast and will apply only the definition of faithfulness to it. Now, I've already told you it's going to wind up being that. But it's much, much deeper than that. 
Paul begins by telling the Corinthians, I have preached the gospel unto you and you have received it. You received it. And you're here this morning because you may not have received the gospel. I think everybody has. But if you have not, you know a little something about it. The gospel. And all too often in churches, the gospel is some kind of a handle that you get a hold of. And this is what we preach. Well, what is it? Well, we preach about Jesus. We preach about how much he loves you. We preach about how much uh, he gave for you. We preach a lot of things. Paul identifies it here as the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And we need also to identify with that gospel because you have received the teaching of what Jesus has done for you. Because you have received it, therefore, you need to have that faithfulness, that steadfastness, that grip a hold of, that base to stand on. It needs to mean to you that I am not going to get off of that pedestal. I am not going to let it go. Because it's good news. That's what gospel means. It's good news I don't have to go to hell. It's good news that God will accept me in my weaknesses. It's good news that I can pray and he will forgive me my sins. Thank you, God. This therefore then always must be tied to steadfastness. Don't take what he did in the resurrection chapter and all of those things he said, all of those blessings, and then say, it's okay if I do whatever I want to do. It's not. I must hold on to my Lord, to the sacrifice he gave, and to the blessings that come to me because of that. And it indicates those blessings. Because you have been blessed and it gives you responsibilities. You need to react because he has blessed me so. I will hold on to those and I will react discharging the responsibilities that he gives. I'm going to give some of those to you in a minute. But there's the mindset. I have been blessed. I will stay with him. And I will accomplish what he wants me to. And you do that because the gospel, this good news, did not come from man, as Paul said in Galatians chapter 1. But it came from God himself. We're still in John chapter 12 down at Springfield in the Sun School class. And in that lesson today, Jesus says, I have told you what the Father told me. And he has given me a commandment. And the commandment is that you should have everlasting life. And I told those people down there, I said, make no mistake about it. This book was written to make us believe, yes. But in the writing of this book, he has told us that God has commanded us to believe. And when somebody does not believe in Jesus, they have gone against the commandment of God. And I said, in your little finite mind, I want you to put yourself in the place of God. As he looks down and sees people who do not believe. And you talk about something big. Therefore, my brethren, be ye steadfast. Paul says by that gospel, you are also saved. 
saved. I'm saved from myself. I'm saved from my weaknesses. I'm saved from my ignorance. I am saved. The church for 50 years, Dale, has argued, are we saved now or is that something coming? Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but I came to save it. And he has been here and he has made the way for salvation. Somebody says, oh yeah, but, you know, you can go away from the Lord. You can sin so as to your law. Yes, you can. That's not what Jesus has in mind. Jesus has in mind you staying with him. Be ye steadfast because he has saved you. Don't lose it. That aunt of mine went to the bank and got some money. I don't know how much it was. She said, I put it right there in my white purse. And we emptied the white purse out. And guess what? The money was not there. I don't know whether it was $10 or whether it was $1,000 or somewhere in between. And we don't know where that money went. Folks, you know what God has in store for you. Don't lose that like she lost that money. Be ye steadfast. Because therefore, those blessings and responsibilities are mine because I am saved. It's the gospel that saved me, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We have commemorated it this morning with the Lord's Supper. I am saved. And if I don't leave the Lord, I will always be saved by the blood that washes my sins away. And if I am not saved, it will not be God that condemns me. It will be me who has left him. Because he has promised. And Jesus did that because of my sins. It's not because how good I am. It's because how bad I am. It's not because he doesn't love me. It's because he does love me. It's not because he doesn't want to be a, uh, with me. It's because he does want to be with me. And when he comes again, it will break his heart if I'm not faithful. Therefore, be ye steadfast. Every day, I need to thank Jesus. Amen? Amen? I need to thank him for blessing me. I ask him as I got up for the people at Springville, Lord, be with me in this lesson. Because I didn't feel real good about it because there's a really a difficult passage about what the prophet says about how God blinded the eyes and hardened the hearts of people. And you know that God now says, whosoever will, let him come and take of the waters of life freely. I said, God help me in that because I don't know. It came out as smooth and pretty and easy as anything I've ever talked. So when I left there, I had something to be thankful for. And I asked him today as I got up from the bench there, Lord, help me, because I don't feel good about this lesson. It's too disjointed. But because of the way God has blessed me, and because I understand the salvation he has offered me, I've got something to thank him for. Not just now, but every single day and it's a part of the therefore because he's blessed me thank you lord <laughs> i received a call last week it wasn't from a cousin dickie it was from a nephew <laughs> he lives in shreveport louisiana 
He said, Uncle Charles, I need help. He said, I had a dream. Now, what it was, I don't know. But I was taken out of my body and held over the flames of hell. And I smelled the sulfur of hell. And I don't want to go there. I need you to help me. And so we talked a little bit about salvation, forgiveness, and faith, confession, repentance, and baptism, and a bunch of other stuff. And I said, I'll come right now to Shreveport if you want me to. He said, no. I'm going to my sister's house in Nashville in two weeks. He said, I want you to come meet me there. And I want you to baptize me. So I want you to pray for him for these two weeks because he has stage four cancer, lung cancer. That he's able to make it to Nashville. That he's able for me to baptize him and that everything works out well. His name is William Grant. I want you to put his name on your prayer list. I don't know whether he had a real out-of-body experience or not. I, You know, it's kind of... Eh. But he believes he did. And he, he did dream it, but he believes that actually happened to him. And he has a change of heart because of it. I wish more people had that. Not fewer. Because then they would see the great importance of steadfastness in the Lord. They would understand the full meaning of therefore because of what's coming if changes are not made. So what it means to us. I'm afraid we go on in our lives and we know academically that the resurrection occurred. And academically we know that we can have forgiveness of sins. But we don't relish in the blessings of that. We don't appreciate what Jesus did. And we don't appreciate what that means to us. And the changes eternally that that means. It's just a religious topic. And we talk about it when we go to church. Well, 1 Corinthians 15 says, all of us are going to be raised. Do, do you hear that? It's not those people long ago, but it's those people now and those people in the future until the Lord comes. If you die, you're going to be raised. Let that soak in. One of the biggest lessons in the scriptures ever taught wasn't a word said. The apostle Paul was going about trying to imprison and beat Christians because that Jesus was a liar. And on the road to Damascus, he met him face to face. And he can't deny him anymore. He cannot say he lied or that the disciples stole his body or any other of those tales and stories that were going on. He could no longer say that. He had to confess the resurrection is real. And just as much as the resurrection is real and a judgment is real, so are heaven and hell. Whether you have the, the experience of smelling the, the sulfur of hell or not does not matter. They are real. So therefore, if they are real, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. 
Paul gives us the proper response for us to make. It's in verse 57. But thanks be to God. Thank you, God, for telling us what's coming, for showing us the future, for giving us the definition of both heaven and hell, and for allowing us, for us to make the choice. You're choosing. Every day you live, you're choosing. And Paul went on to say, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Now I want you to look at that. I did not earn it. It was given to me. And this is a direct quote, by the way. See where the quote marks begin? You won't see the end of the quote marks to the next line. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Those things are coming. The resurrection is real. It is coming. Paul says, I saw him. He was seen of more than 500 people. And most of them are still with us. Go ask them. Thanks be to God. Who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As a Christian, this is exactly where we ought to be. Thank you. Thank you. And everything we do and every thought we have ought to be within the framework of God has blessed me so much. I can have this thought. I can be. I exist. I'm still living in my evilness. He hasn't struck me dead. But through the blood of Jesus, he's forgiven me. Thank you, God. Then Paul uses our verse. Therefore, and I've added because the brethren are beloved. Therefore, beloved brethren is what the King James says. Be. Here is a change. Therefore, because of all of that that's happened, be steadfast. And there's the definition I got from Strong's Concordance. Secure, safe on a solid foundation and held tight. You hold on. You have that faithfulness to Jesus because of all of that stuff he's done for you. What you have in Jesus. And then Paul adds the word immovable. It's telling us that the position of being steadfast cannot be moved. There is nothing that can take that away from you. Because you know the resurrection is real. Because you know the judgment is coming. And you know that heaven and hell is out there and he has given you heaven. And because of that... There is nothing that can keep you from the faithfulness of being steadfast in the Lord. Do you see that? The world can't pry it out of you. It doesn't matter how smart people are and how many degrees they have and how much they tell you that God isn't. He is. There's no temptation that can come your way that can take you away from the Lord. And there's no sin and no weakness or anything else should be able to separate you from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus. Because you know it's real. But then he gives us something to do. An aimless life is not a healthy life. Now, self-help programs give you, uh, as a very start of, 
What's important to you? Where are you heading? What do you plan to accomplish? And they have you to write down goals and, and all these kinds of structured things. Well, there is something to that. And when I'm counseling with people, one of the first things I do is I ask them, what do you do? And they'll say, well, I work at XYZ or I do this or that. And I say, I don't mean that. That's not important. What do you do for the Lord? Huh? I go to church is usually the answer. Sometimes. I don't mean that. What do you do for the Lord? And I keep hounding that on them because we all need to do something and we don't do it for ourselves. You do it for the Lord so he in turn can bless you. And when you feel down in the dumps, get off your lazy backside and go find somebody that's in worse shape than you are and try to relieve their pain. When you feel worthless, find somebody that needs help and help them to accomplish something. When you feel like nobody cares, then you be a person who cares about other people and you get out and you go to them and you show them, I care. And you know what happens when you do that kind of activity? You take your mind off of self. <laughs> and when you take your mind off of self, you'll start feeling better. Well, Paul wants us to be abounding always in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. So I said, well, what does that mean? Abound means to go beyond. It means to do more than, accomplish. You are always active. In praising God, for instance. Now, you may not can do much, but you can say, thank you, God. You may not have very many means, but you can thank God for all the blessings he's done for you. Just read chapter 15. And you can love other people. You can even love your enemies. You can lead others to the, to the Lord by saying, come to worship with me. You may not can teach a Bible class, but you can say, come worship with me. You can do as Jesus did in Luke chapter 1, go about doing good. There are lots of ways that you can be busy in abounding for the work of the Lord. And when you do those kinds of things, everything you do becomes his. And it becomes your worship in your life. I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And honor the Lord in all you do. And when you do that, Victory is sure. Victory is sure. Get that in your mind. This afternoon, our U.S. ladies soccer team is going to play for the World's Cup Championship. Some people like them. Some people don't because of their attitudes towards some things. It doesn't matter whether you like them or not. Their victory right now at this particular time is not sure. They have an outstanding soccer, te uh, soccer team. But the Netherlands also has an outstanding soccer team or they wouldn't be in the World Cup Finals. And as good as our girls from this country are, and I really hope they win, they may not be as good as those girls from the Netherlands. 
and it's not sure. Now, why am I throwing that in there? Because your victory is sure. Theirs is not. It has already been fixed. Jesus died to set your victory. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. Therefore, be you steadfast and immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. Because we've been promised this victory, it's why the therefore is there. You've been promised the victory, therefore, but don't stop with that word. This is why it's listed as steadfast instead of therefore. Don't stop with therefore. You're going to be able to win all your spiritual battles. I got a woman at Springwood. Every time I bring that up on Wednesday night Bible class, usually, it's not usually not in the morning, it's usually on Wednesday night. She says, I tell old Satan to get out of my life every day. And I invite the Lord to take his place. And she says, I want you to know it works. So when you get ready to do a sin, just say, get out of here, Satan, Lord, come. And it will change your heart, it will change your mind, it will change your actions. He will help you win. Therefore, be steadfast in it. He will help you win at the judgment because you're not going to have to answer as a Christian for yourself. Did you know that? We're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, but you've already been judged innocent of all of your sins. And therefore, as long as you are steadfast with him, he will continue forgiving you your sins and none of them will ever make it to the judgment. None. And he's going to answer for you. He's going to say, Father, I, I took those sins from him. And I've already paid the price for them. Therefore, be steadfast. Because heaven's going to be your reward. Be ye steadfast. You can have strength in your faith with that. You can go away from here. And if you really paid attention, have the strength of a, you'll be the strongest person in the world. Because you know Jesus was raised. And that proves you're also going to be raised. And it, it proves the judgment is real. And it's coming. And I don't know whether that man smelled the sulfur of hell. Or whether God gave him a real experience. I don't know. I'm not even going to question it. But I know he said, I don't want to go there. And I think if you and I ever saw what hell was like, really saw it, we wouldn't want to go there. So therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen.